Hello, friends. How you all are doing? I'm also doing great. So today we will be learning the Companies Amendment Act. Important highlights: what has happened in that 2020 Act and what things has to be observed. Let's see. Decriminalization of the Companies Act. The MCA they have constituted a review committee under the chairmanship of Injit Srinivas. Okay, so that was a review committee which was co constituted and to review the offenses which are prescribed under the act and to analyze, to examine, to peruse the need to decriminalize the offenses. So the government, they had the feeling that we have to decriminalize the companies act because too many penalties are imposed into those provisions which are not requiring that. And by they invited recommendations, that recommendations was given by this committee to the central government. Now what happened next? Suggestions of the committee were taken into picture and recategorization of 16 offenses out of the 81 to an in-house adjudication framework, wherein the defaults would be subject to penalty by an adjudication officer. So that, that came into picture over here and instituting a transparent and technology-driven in-house adjudication mechanism that was started and increasing the transparency in the in-house adjudication mechanism by minimizing the physical interference that was developed and conducting the proceedings on online platform and publication of orders on the website so they started the committee gave out the suggestions and that suggestions was widely adopted by the government and it was 2009 companies amendment act okay so that's what it is a strengthening the in-house adjudication mechanism with the ultimate aim of archiving the better compliances and declogging nclt by enlarging the jurisdiction of regional director based on these recommendations the committee the central government they brought about relevant changes by passing the company's amendment 2019 act now then that leaves me a question what was the need for the company's amendment act 2020 well, despite this ease and this penal pressure which was brought about about the government they continue to feel the acute need to further liberalize and relax the stringent penal provisions of the act the company law committee they recommended for the decriminalization of the companies act as much needed change in the today's corporate world and in the line with the global practices, it is essential to strike a balance between the civil and criminal liabilities. So the government started realizing that despite all the efforts that has been taken in the past, we still need something to decriminalize. We de still need that amendment to be in place. And that is the reason why it was noted that a serious violations of law, especially the wrongful conduct involving fraudulent elements, should be dealt with under the criminal law due to the nature of such wrongs and the degree of public interest involved it may be prudent to adopt a strict approach to the fraudulent conduct that means the government was of the opinion when there is a fraudulent conduct then a strict approach was the most appropriate however if there is a procedural thing if there is a technical thing there is minor non-compliances especially the ones not involving any subjective determinations may be dealt with civil jurisdiction instead of criminal so why should we should be penalized for uh, technical defaults or procedural defaults that does not require because there was no fraudulent intent there was no question of mens rea okay the government did this they brought about amendment of the companies act 2020 for that Okay, so what, what things changed? I'm not discussing the every part of it, but I'm highlighting those important things that has gone into change. So omission of certain offenses. The Companies Amendment Act has omitted certain offenses which relates to non-compliance of orders of NCLT. That is like orders with variation of shares rights, rectification of registers, publication of order of NCLT for reduction of share capital, redemption of debentures. So if you don't comply with this, now it is just a procedural requirement. You can be penalized for this. And further, the offenses provided in Section 342, Subsection 6 of the Companies Act 2013, related to the penal provision with respect to non-cooperation by the liquidator or any present or past officer of the company is omitted, leaving it to the prosecuting court to mandate the cooperation. 
So it is now up to the court to decide about it. But in this liquidation process, this part has been omitted. Okay, removing imprisonment and subjecting offenses to fine alone. Here, the legislature has removed the imprisonment for certain listed offenses while retaining the criminal liability to the payment of fine alone, such as for contravention of matters which are prescribed to be stated in the prospectus. Under that section 26, or failure of the company to comply with the requirements of the special license under section 8. Or defaulting and complying with the buyback requirements under 68. The legislature has just imposed fine. That's it. They have removed that imprisonment thing. Okay, they have removed that imprisonment thing absolutely in these kind of provisions. So they have made things far more ease of doing business. Okay, recategorization. Now keeping in mind the overall pendency of cases in the courts and in attempt to elevate the burden of the courts, the Companies Act 2020 that seeks to enforce and adopt a principle-based approach in removing the imposition of penal consequences or in case of a min minute and technical defaults so that each small kind of defaults, you should, you should not be scary about it, you should not be penalized about it. And further, levying of such monetary penalties can now be adjudicated in-house by an in-house adjudication mechanism as it is provided in section 454 of the Companies Act without having to approach any kind of criminal codes. So that is a very good step which the government has taken. Okay, and thus in case of default relates to non-compliance of section 94, the annual written part or subsection 4 or subsection 1 or 2 of 137, the annual accounts filing part. So such default has been rectified either prior to or within 30 days of issue of notice by the adjudicating officer. Then no penalty, that word is important, no penalty shall be imposed. So if, if, if the company is receiving notice now as per the 2020 thing and they rectify their defects, there is no question of imposing penalty now. Impose and all the proceedings under the section in respect of the default shall be deemed to be concluded see so look at the way they have done that and extended the applicability for 46 b i know i i'm not everyone is comfortable but this is a new section which has been introduced and if you have read it good enough if you haven't read it do read it for your next attempt now companies amendment act 2020 extended the applicability of this section for 46 b relating to lesser penalty for the small companies and one person companies to all the provisions of the companies act which attract monetary penalties and also extend same benefit to the producer companies and even to startup companies so what is this summing up to well in case one person company a small company a startup company or a producer company or by any of its officer in default or by any person in respect of such company then such company its officer in default or any other person as the case may be they shall be liable to a penalty which shall be not more than one half of the penalty specified in the provision that's it you just have to pay half of the penalty subject to a maximum of 2 lakhs in case of a company and 1 lakh in case of an officer in default and uh, any other person as the case may be. So now one person company, small company, a startup company, producer company, the threat that used to be there, it's like 5 lakhs of penalty or 100, so 103 times a penalty, that thing is relaxed. Okay, you don't have to worry about you. Okay, you think about your business, you carry on your business, and the government says you just have to pay two lakhs maximum penalties. Look at this maximum penalty of two lakhs on the company and one lakh on that officer in default. That's it. So they have improvised this. And offenses where alternate mechanism is provided. Well, the amendment has further brought an alternate framework for mechanism of supervision of certain provisions such as non-compliance with the order of regional director directing, directing a change of the name of the company or the criminal uh, fine which is introduced in section 16 subsection 3 is all substituted by enabling central government to allot a new name to the deterrent of the company and directed the registrar to enter the new name in the register of companies in place of the old name and issue a third fresh certificate of incorporation which the company can issue thereafter so what what, what exactly has happened they have simplified the mechanisms 
So if, if a company has a common name, then the regional director can issue a notice and the company can change the name. That's it. You should not be penalizing a company for that. So the criminal offense thing has been done away. Okay. So they will allot a new name and they will direct the company to change the name in, in the place of the old name and a fresh certificate of incorporation can be issued by ROC to that respect. Okay. Similarly, another important change that has been brought in this mechanism is with regard to section 441 subsection 5. Okay, in case of non-compliance with the order of compounding authority, the punishment by way of imprisonment and the criminal fine is substituted by doubling the compounding fees automatically. So, you don't have to bother that you will be put in jail for that. You are compounding an offense. Okay, you're settling an offense. And suddenly, if you can't pay the penalty, you will be thrown in jail. Okay, the government says, no worries. Now, you will not be thrown in jail. You just have to pay double the penalty. That's it. And the intention of the legislation is to deter non-compliances by imposing a greater penalty rather than by initiating a separate offense for the same non-compliance. Okay, and then uh, further, uh, that is continuing the alternate mechanism. Further, the contravention on Section 284 of the Companies Act, which deals with failure of the employees, promoters, and directors to cooperate with the company's liquidator. They attracted an imposition of a fine as per the Act. However, the amendment has removed such fine and has empowered the company liquidator to apply to NCLT to obtain the directions. So, in case of liquidation now, there will no more be a fine by the liquidator on the employees, on the promoters, on the directors of the company. And the company liquidator has to approach nclt for any kind of direction they need it okay so that thing has changed and easing out the framework of the corporate responsibility yes under the companies like every company with a net worth of 500 crores or more or turnover of 1000 crore or more or a net profit of five crores or more during the immediately preceding financial year are required to constitute a csr committee Okay, and they have to spend 2% of the average net profits of the company made during the three immediately preceding financial years towards the CSR policy. That, that, that's the provision that existed. Now, companies like the Amendment 2020, what has they made? They have exempted the companies with the CSR liability of just 50 lakhs a year from setting up CSR committee. So if you don't have, uh, if you have a CSR liability of just 50 lakhs a year, you don't have to bother about CSR committee because constituting a committee, there are persons involved and they have to be paid for it. So it's like uh, putting resources to something that the company is not getting anything out of it. So the government has, uh, okay, allowed that kind of change. So if it's just a 50 lakhs things, Okay, no CSR. Further, companies which spend up an, um, any amount in excess of the CSR obligation in a financial year, they are entitled to set up the excess amounts towards their CSR obligation in the subsequent financial year. That's a unique step, the much needed step that the government has taken. Okay, clear? And easing out the framework in corporate social with regard to the penal provision if a company is in default in complying with the provision of subsection 5 of subsection 6 of section 135, which related to CSR expenditure, the company shall be liable to a penalty of twice the amount that has to be transferred to the company to the fund specified in Schedule 7 to the Companies Act or to the unspent corporate social responsibility account as the case may be or one curve whichever is less so now they have made 135 a penal provision it was voluntary a time ago but now they have made it a penal provision okay so there is a penalty which was imposed that if you're not Getting into the CSO expenditure, the penalty can be the twice the amount or one crore, whichever is less. And every officer of the company who is in default shall be liable to a penalty of one tenth of the amount which is required to be transferred by the company to such fund in the Schedule 7 of the Companies Act or to the unspent corporate social responsibility account or two lakhs, whichever is less. So the penalty on the officer in default is one tenth or two lakhs, whichever is less. Okay, there, now there is a change, change in the definition of listed company under section 2, subsection 52. What is that? See, prior to the amendment, the definition says that a company which has listed any of its securities on the recognized stock exchange is a listed company. That, that thing used to cause trouble for the private company which is listing its debt securities. 
So the company law committee felt that classifying a private limited company as a listed company merely based on the listing of the debt securities often on a private placement basis is absolutely inappropriate and is required to be addressed as they are skeptical about the strict regulations imposed on the listed company as opposed to unlisted private companies. So this, this now gives a private company a chance, a liberty to come ahead to issue certain kind of debt securities. And if the private company grows up in future, they can be a listed company. So here, they, there were many compliances for the private company because they were called as a listed company. So the government has done certain change. So there is no differentiation but under the act, whether the company is an equity listed or a debt listed company. And the compliances are the same, which is not the case with SEBI listing regulations, wherein the compliances are less for a debt listed company. So in line with that, the government steps to promote ease of doing business. The committee decided that it would be more appropriate to exclude, yes, the word is exclude, private companies from the definition of listed company. You can, you can see the change that the government has brought about after realizing those things. Okay, so the central government has now been empowered to exclude such class of companies under the definition of listed companies which are listed or intended to list such class of securities as may be as prescribed in consultation with SEBI. Thus, the companies which have a listed on the debt securities, that is a non-convertible debentures like thing, may be excluded from the definition of listed company for the purpose of Companies Act. Now, remember, that it's a central government which is empowered. So, once they put in the provisions, you are exempted. Okay. Now, introduction of producer company. Now, that, that was a long demanded thing that the compliances of the producer company, we have to go back and again for 1956 Act again and again, even though that act was brought to an end. So the government has changed this. The concept of the producer company was introduced in India in 2002 with the insertion of Chapter 9A in 1956 Act. And the purpose behind the introduction of the concept of the producer company is to regulate Indian agrarian economy more effectively. The producer company is a body corporate comprising of farmers and agriculturalists who work in cooperation with each other to promote better standards of living, gain an easier access to credit, technology, market, etc. The Companies Act 2013 does not contain any separate provisions which relating to producer companies. So, by virtue of Section 465 of the Companies Act, producer company continued to be given by the Part 9A of 1956 Act. But considering that 1956 Act has been repealed, it is not feasible to amend any of the provisions of Part 9A of the Companies Act, even though these continue to remain in force. So that's exactly the pro problem, that tomorrow if you want to amend producer company, you have to revive a dead law. And how could you do that? That's the thing, the producer company for amending the provision pertaining to the producer company, even if it is assumed that such amendment is legally tenable, would become convoluted and tedious in the light of Companies Act. Because how, how could you be doing that? So the government was facing a real situation. So was the company law committee. And that's what they recommended. The CLT propounded that since the government is keen on promoting producer company, it may appropriate take up the amendments and relaxations to the applicable laws for such companies instead of waiting for more time for a new law to be enacted. And in line with this CLC proposal, the Companies Amendment Act 2020 has introduced that similar to the 1956 Act governance for such companies also. So yes, now you have to study the producer company as per 2013 Act. The 2020 Act has combined it here. So at the outset, these provisions relating to incorporation of producer companies, other matters, share capital of members, general meetings, share capital, powers and functions of the board, merger, amalgamation, they all have been now included in the Companies Act 2013, consequent to the Companies Amendment Act 2020. Okay, and now this was one of the big issues of consultation paper was issued by SEBI and many things were discussed. SEBI has introduced right issue requirements and so there was a need filled to change the company law and 
here it is coming up the right issue is an option which is exercisable by existing shareholders for the company to purchase further share capital in proportion to the current holding which is exercisable for that specified period the companies typically pursue the right issue as an avenue to raise the funds for various reasons ranging from expansion or acquisition or paying down the debts section 6 uh, 62 of the uh, 2013 Act, that governs that process. So you know what is the right issue, the issue which is made to the existing shareholders so that you can raise a capital for the company, for any kind of project or for the payment of debt or anything for the well-being of the company. That was right issue. Now, only this year, SEBI introduced a discussion paper, which I was talking about, and there were certain comments which was given by us too, reviewing the process of the rights issue. The paper highlighted the need to reduce the timelines in both the pre-issue opening phase and after the closure phase to the better serve the interest of the issuer and the investor. Because see, due to technology, the things have become faster. So there is no point in waiting for 15 days for a right issue, a minimum framework when you can complete the same thing in two to three days to five to seven days. Right? So there, it is also proposed several measures for staying by making amendments to the regulatory mechanism under the relevant SEBI regulations. Now through this, the timeline for the date of the board meeting to decide upon the right issue to date of listing of the shares was proposed to cut down from nearly 55 to 58 days to roughly 31 days. As you can see, that there is a dramatic reduction in the number of days. And in line with this, CLC has observed that a pro market price, that is the issuance of an offer is completely closes with two to three days. And the allotment is completed within five to seven days itself. Look at the change that the government is proposing. Okay, and reduction of timelines of right to shoot committee was of the view in light of the market practices under section 62 subsection 1 of the companies act be amended to enable the central government to prescribe a shorter time period than the mandatory 15 days period as i was discussing the, you, previously we require that 15 days now it has to be reduced so the amended provision now reads the offer shall be made by a notice specifying the number of shares and limiting the time here the important not being less than 15 days or such lesser period not more it's lesser period as may be prescribed and not exceeding 31 days from the date of the offer within which the offer was accepted so they changed this and they brought the period to less than 15 days shall be deemed to have been declined so this enables the company to close the right offer in a real shorter period and complete the entire process why should i be waiting for 15 days when i'm in the electronic age i'm getting all my shareholders approval okay and the constitution of nclity bench long demanded provision it was demanded that nclity is all the way in delhi and not from every branch of india we could be approaching there no doubt I practiced there, but there was a demand from many of the persons, on, including my clients, that how could we be approaching each time over there? So here, Amendment Act has inserted Section 418A with the objective of setting up a benches of NCLT, that is National Company Law after the Tribunal. And that will ordinarily sit in New Delhi in such other places as the central government may in consultation with the chairperson notify. So yet they have not decided where they will establish, but now there is a provision for establishing NCLT branches also. Because yes, there are too many cases coming into picture. And the said benches of NCLT will be constituted by at least one judicial member and one technical. Remember the word is at least, so you can have more than one also. Considering the quantum of cases the NCLT has to deal with, this is a welcome move which will not only reduce the burden of NCLT, but will ensure a speedy disposal of the matters addressed to the NCLT. Okay? The provisions for allowing payment of remuneration to the non-executive directors in case of inadequacy of profit. This was another thing which was widely demanded. Because it, no doubt, what, whatever you say, it's a non-executive director, it's an independent director, yet they put in time, they put in efforts, they start reading, they do things about the company. So something has to be paid. Now, big companies started following the policy they started paying them but not every company was comfortable and as a result there was no motivation to become a independent director or a non-executive director 
So now the government has come up clear with that, that section 197 and 198 of the Companies Act set out the provisions for remuneration payable by public companies to its executive directors, including the whole time directors, managing directors, managers, and non executive other than the whole time and managing directors. The 197 subsection 3 provides that if a company has no profits or its profits are inadequate, then the company shall not pay any remuneration other than sitting fees to its directors, including the managing director, whole time director, manager, except the provision of Schedule 5 will come in the picture. Okay, clear? Now, here, the above mentioned provisions read, read together to provide for remuneration payable to executive directors in every case including the case of inadequacy of profits also. So while sections 2 of part 2 of schedule 5 provides for remuneration payable to managerial person where the company has no or inadequate profits, similar provisions has not been done for the non-executive directors. The company noted that in case of independent directors, when you read section 149 subsection 9, notwithstanding anything contained in any of the provisions of the act, but subject to the provisions of 197 and 198, an independent director not be entitled stock option and may receive remuneration by way of fee provided under subsection 5 of 197 again, and reimbursement of expenses for participation on the board and other meetings and profit related commission as may be approved by the members. Okay, so what has been done? So the company noted that non-executive directors, including independent directors, they devote their valuable time and have experience and have critical advice to the company. Now, therefore, should, they should be appropriately compensated for the same, even in case of inadequacy of profits or if there are losses is permissible. So the CLC discussed the crucial role which is played by independent director of the company in terms of bringing objectivity into the functioning of the board and improvising its effectiveness. Okay, so does the committee feel that there is a need for the companies to adopt the remuneration policy that would attract and retain the talented, motivated directors? So it was felt that inconsistency in the payment of remuneration in case of inadequacy of profits or losses to the executive director vis a vis a non executive director will, will actually be a disincentive to them. So that's, that's the reason why something has to be done. And therefore, the committee concluded that it would be appropriate to bring specific provision in regard to section 149 and 197 before any amendments is made to Schedule 5 in this regard. Okay, so now the amendment to the provision of 149, subsection 5, and 197, the payment of remuneration to non executive directors, including the independent director, has been provided. And such remuneration shall be payable in accordance with Schedule 5. So look at the change that this change has come into being. And such remuneration shall be exclusive of any kind of fee for attending the meetings of the board or committees or for any other purpose whatsoever. So that's the word exclusive. It shall not be a part of the fee or sitting fees as may be decided by the board under 197 subsection 5. This, this is another welcome feature that enables a company to attract or talented directors on their board of directors. Okay, now when we talk about listing of security on the foreign exchange, that is a new thing where that has come into picture. New subsection 3 and 4 has been introduced to section 23 relating to public offer and private placement empowering the central government to permit certain class of public companies to issue certain class of security for the purpose of listing on this permitted stock exchange in permissible foreign jurisdiction or other jurisdiction as may be prescribed. The central government may exempt any class of public companies in a newly inserted section, subsection 3 of this section, section 23, from any of the provisions of the Companies Act. So if you want to go in for listing for a foreign stock exchange, okay, the government, the government is ready to recognize that and they can relax the provisions of prospectus and allotment of security, of share capital and debentures, declaration of beneficial interest, register significant to beneficial ownership, or failure to distribute dividends. These provisions can be relaxed if the, if the government is permitting the class of companies to enlist their securities on the stock exchange having foreign jurisdictions. So look at the welcome step, the steps that, that has been taken. This enables Indian corporates, which are very well known 
in international market to list their security in permissible foreign jurisdiction. So now the ambit of Companies Act has gradually grown up because by allowing this kind of listing, you try to understand gradually the provisions of international level will be entering those companies and those compliance rules will be entering into your curriculum also because ultimately they require compliances and who better can us then do that, okay? Okay, now exemptions from filing resolution that was again demanded that each time we have to file resolution. So what was the thing the committee discussed and decided? Only the provision in respect of resolutions that is passed to grant of loans, gives a guarantee, providing security in respect of loans, and the clause F of subsection 3 of section 179 in the ordinary course of business was not applicable to the banking company. Okay, however, such exemption was not available to non-banking financial company, NBFC and housing finance company. So they were required to file that. Though some of them as big as a banking company and such confidentiality was required to be maintained. So now the same has been extended to the class of NBFC company which is registered in Chapter 3B of the Reserve Bank of India Act and to any class of housing finance company that was registered in the National Housing Bank. So now NBFCs and HFCs have been given that liberty that they are not required to file resolutions which is passed in the ordinary course of business which has confidential information. Okay, so therefore any class of NBFC and class of housing finance companies are also exempt from filing resolutions pass to grant loan or to give guarantees or to provide security in respect of loans in the ordinary course of their business and periodic financial results for unlisted company okay at present only listed companies are required to submit the financial results duly audited or limited review with the stock exchange under the SEBI listing that's the provision we know however private company and unlisted public companies as big as listed companies in their size they are under the obligation to file their results only annually with the registrar okay yes there are a large number of private companies and unlisted public companies which have grown real big in size so now we are this 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 concentrate 129a is there that is inserted with the by the central government that requires such class of companies or unlisted companies as may be prescribed to prepare the financial results of the company on such periodic basis and in such form as may be prescribed to obtain approval of the board of directors and complete audit and limited review of such periodic financial results as may be prescribed and file a copy with the registrar within a 30 days of the completion of the relevant period as may be prescribed. So as you can see the government has brought big private companies and unlisted public companies also in the compliance ambit and yes it has encouraged or increased your roles okay now 2020 inter alia amongst other things they have clarified the jurisdiction of the trial court on the basis of the place of a commission of the offense under section 452 of the act wrongfully withholding the property of the company by its officers they have clarified that they have also relaxed the provisions relating to charging of higher ed additional fees for default of two or more occasion in submitting of filing, registering, recording documents under section 403. So that used to be there, 403, you remember that? And exempted any class of persons from complying with the requirements of section 89 relating to declaration of beneficial interest in shares, exempting any class of foreign companies or companies incorporated outside India from the provisions of chapter 22 relating to companies incorporated outside India. Okay, at the conclusion, I can say at the outset, the relaxations which has been provided under this act can only help the companies in reduction of the compliances cost, but will also help focus on the business activities. It will be easier for the companies to rectify their defaults, pay the penalty, become compliant, as well as align with the objectives of promoting ease of doing business. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being